I'm Tom Paddock, Vice President, Audio Systems for ARC International, and the founder of Sonic Focus. Today it's my pleasure to introduce you to Sonic Focus. Sonic Focus is all about the customer experience. We build refinement technologies that can power your products and give you a clear advantage over products that lack our unique digital refinement engine. But before I begin, I'd like to share some experiences that I've had in the music industry over the last 30 years. I'd like to explain why I believe that you need Sonic Focus audio processing, our Sonic Focus processing engine, and why it should be powering your consumer-facing products. Let's take a step back in time. You heard the music, Grateful Dead. When I hear stage, I don't, pipeline, I don't think semiconductors, I think early morning, Las Vegas, rolling in with 18-wheelers and uh, big PAs. Um, 1995, when the internet started, YouTube generation hadn't even existed at that time. Um, and online music was rare, and music webcasts were unheard of. Grateful Dead one of the highest grossing rock and roll bands in the history of the world, over $50 million a year, primarily because of their sound, um, gave me a call and they said, we think we want to do a webcast. And I said, webcast? Yeah, okay, we're, we're working on your website, we're doing email, we've got a little bit of content up there. Is this possible? They said, yeah, we've heard that you can broadcast music over the internet. So I said, okay, um, yeah, I'll build one more system and uh, we'll do the best we can. I'm sure it'll sound great. Um, I really had no idea that webcast was um, uh, hard to do and didn't sound good. Can you hear me okay? Huh? Uh, so I promised something I couldn't deliver. Unfortunately, uh, the internet really didn't work yet. Uh, people with good connectivity were the universities and government agencies and not anyone else. Everyone else had a, had a 56K modem that worked okay. Um, so I accepted the challenge of the webcast. Um, and I really didn't know what I was getting into. So we called some, uh, some friends we had at Silicon Graphics who were deadheads. And um, the people at Silicon Graphics said, oh yeah, we can, we can help you with that webcast. We build the internet's best servers and yeah, we'll We'll set up, well, let's go wire up a T1. We said, okay. So we went to the Fillmore in San Francisco where we'd done lots of webcasts. Uh, I'm sorry, lots of broadcasts, uh, not, not on the web. And we uh, hooked up a T1 and we got all the AT&T people up there, and wired it up to our facility where we did mastering and uh, we were ready to go. And so we went to the uh, Fillmore in December 12, 1995. And and the band members came and we'd done some tests and it all seemed good and we had four or five people with computers out testing, yeah, it's pretty good, it's kind of dropping out, but uh, you know, it'll be better. Well, kind of dropping out was kind of how the internet worked those days and um, it didn't get better, it got worse. Essentially, we clogged all of the internet pipelines worldwide. We took down Japan uh, we had so many people that logged in, deadheads that logged in in Japan, that the internet failed completely. Uh, which made the band members happy, actually. They said, we took down Tokyo. Yeah. Well, okay, so that was fun. Uh, but unfortunately, while the broadcast was a huge success, the audio was absolutely terrible. So we had real-time chatter sending information, questions to the band members, and and the band members were answering questions and some of the information that came in was yeah, it's choppy and the stuff I can hear sounds really bad and the band members saying uh, 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 we thought this was going to be audiophile quality and I said so did I so unfortunately we couldn't deliver on the promise um, audio sounded bad and uh, compressed audio didn't sound good and low bitrate compressed audio sounded even better and, at worst, and that's about all we could give the world in 95. Um, but I knew I could do better, and I, um, I made a 
personal promise to myself that as a direct result of the horrendous sound of that first webcast, that I would figure out a way of making digital audio sound better. Not to mention the fact that we derived lots of revenue from creating audiophile quality products for Grateful Dead and, and other bands. So, well, let's move back around 17 years before that show. Uh, 1978, I was working with Francis Ford Coppola and Grateful Dead on Apocalypse Now. Uh, no digital back then. Uh, soundtracks were all analog. We had multiple analog machines, two-inch tape. We were using digital to synchronize the machines, but we weren't using digital audio. No CD was around. Everything was on tape, one inch, two inch tape. It's either 16 or 24 tracks. And it sounded really, really good. And we used tape as our master, and then we made an LP from that tape master. Uh, I remember the experience of hearing an LP that was extremely well mastered. Uh, my favorite LP was Asia by Steely Dan, and I remember setting up a moving coil cartridge and calibrating the low impedance preamp and hooking it up to a mixing console and calibrating the mixing console with some archaic analyzer we had at the time. And remember, the sound of that LP, the analog sound of a moving coil low mass cartridge with Asia, I said, this is it. This is why I'm in audio engineering, is because of that sound, that emotion that I felt. It, it, it was ear replaceable. It was, it was unique, and I still remember it today. Um, Patrick Amory says, vinyl is the true version of the release, with better sound quality above all. Uh, vinyl is the format of choice for people who care about music. Now, why would people care about vinyl? Vinyl doesn't have very good top end. Uh, the bass is maybe a little mushy. However, the voices on vinyl are extremely accurate. There's no holes. The cymbals, while they're somewhat deficient in high frequency sizzle, sound natural. It sounds good and believable. Um, so the same year as the release of Apocalypse Now, the first optical disc was produced, and we were excited to put it in the studio and listen to it. And, unfortunately, the optical disc was really not designed for audio. It was designed for video, and the people at Philips came up with uh, a way of, of putting digital video down on a disc, and I guess they couldn't get enough content on. Not sure what the failure was. Um, but the project never really got off the ground, and so Philips said, hmm, if we can use this for audio instead. We've been working on this for years. Uh, you know, it's a big budget. So the Compact disc, he called it the compact rack, uh, compact stack, reduced rack. All the terms they used to describe the contest, uh, compact disc had nothing to do with high quality audio. It wasn't high definition anything. It was small and portable. It had to do with storage and not with audio quality. 